Evening, everyone, and every time Glenn introduces me, I can't wait to hear myself speak. <laughs> You're most kind and gracious, and I appreciate it. Uh, so many of you have mentioned that you hear our broadcast, and that's a blessing. I'm sorry we're not here in the Fargo area and uh, more, Moorhead, Minnesota, uh, but you can hear us on the Internet 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The site is davidhawking.org. We also archive, so if you miss the broadcast, you can go back up and hear what you might have missed. And we also have articles about uh, Israel, Bible prophecy. Uh, feel free to download them. They're all downloadable and free. And often we have Bible studies on there that you can use for Bible classes, Sunday school classes, whatever. Uh, that's our desire to get the Word of God out. We also put out, almost on every biblical book study I have, uh, we put out a series of sermon notes, either on CD format or MP3, or even in hard copy, eight and a half by 11. And uh, we have many, many downloads, over 500 a day off the site. We also have over a million listeners on the internet, so we thank the Lord for it in 152 countries. Now, I've been asked to mention also about the Blue Letter Bible Institute. I noticed a number of you have been on it, uh, but a lot of you don't know about it. If you will go on your computer to blueletter.org, that's a search engine, like a study. Uh, on the left side uh, is a series of things, and at the bottom you'll see Blue Letter Bible Institute. Uh, the guys that do this are not pastors, uh, they're technology guys. Um, every one of them actually left six-figure salaries to come and join their efforts. Uh, they call themselves the Sewing Circle, S-O-W-I-N-G. I like that title. They want to sow the Word of God through technology around the world in multiple languages. You should also know that the Firefighters for Christ that you see out here distributing those uh, CDs for nothing, uh, that also is run by uh, Blue Letter, uh, the sewing circle that puts out the Blue Letter Bible. Now the Blue Letter Bible Institute, these guys are really good and they have full college credit already. So you can take this, this is not uh, Mickey Mouse type stuff, excuse me, but sometimes that's all it is. Uh, that uh, people advertise. Uh, they have taken our course material, and I've taught, of course, for many years, college and graduate school. They've taken the courses and organized them into a 16-week semester course with uh, brief testings for each one, as well as a final examination over it. And uh, it's just been really amazing. Uh, they're not advertising anywhere. It's just word of mouth. Pick it up off the internet. We have two courses there. One is in Christology, the doctrine of our Lord. And uh, you'll be interested to know that we now have close to 40,000 people in 152 countries who have taken that course already. We have a second course on there called The Attributes of God. And uh, God is blessing that. It just started last spring and we now have over 15,000 people who have taken that course. So we thank the Lord. And the internet can be a curse, but it also can be a blessing. Amen? It sure is a blessing to my wife. Uh, she says, David, you look so good in a tie, maybe you ought to. No! <laughs> this is enough! Can't wait to get home and take it off. <laughs> but seriously, uh, she said it, it's really wonderful. Uh, you know, the folks that can't be here and uh, watching it on uh, internet uh, on the website of uh, godlyconferences.com and how thankful we are and I appreciate it Glenn for you expressing that to Calvary Chapel Tri-City in Tempe Arizona our thanks to them for a wonderful job well as you know our conference has focused on last days and there have been a lot of subjects that I would call more cultural apologetics perhaps uh, some discernment issues uh, I personally thought the last study we just had by Jacob Prash uh, was one of the better ones. Uh, Jacob's a wild man, I know that, and um, I don't know how he keeps walking back and forth. If I even tried that, Jacob, I'd 
trip and fall. I know he would. So it amazes me how you motor around up here. But anyway, that message, breaking down the foundation of the church and how churches get away from it, I thought was outstanding. And we need to remember that and uh, take heed. So in looking at the theme and thinking of this last message of our conference, although we do have tomorrow morning, but officially, uh, I decided to take a look at what we have in the book of Revelation in a little different way. So take your Bibles and open it to Revelation chapter 1. And I'm calling this the last words for last days. Now there's a sense in which there are some words that are last beyond what I'm talking about. If you go clear to chapter 22, you will see three times our Lord saying, Behold, I come quickly. And a lot of the uh, criticisms about the book of Revelation are, well, it hasn't happened, it's been 1900 years. Well, actually, that's showing a lot of ignorance. The Greek word takios, which has eight grammatical forms in the New Testament, is not talking about uh, a time factor coming quick. Uh, we would translate in English, there'll be no time for preparation. The point is, when the Lord does come, you can't say, hey, hold it while I get my life straightened out. Uh-uh. No, no, no. He's going to come quickly. So we could go to that as last words, and John's answer to that, even so, come Lord Jesus. Who, who of us would not want to make that the theme of our hearts? But I'm looking at the first three chapters. In chapter 4, uh, to the end of the book, we have that which is future. That is my uh, viewpoint of the book of Revelation. Everything from chapter 4, verse 1, to the end of the book is all future. And I really love this book because of its title. After hearing the message we just heard from Brother uh, Jacob Prash, what a thrill then to open up Revelation and read The Revelation of Jesus Christ. That's the title of the book. Apocalypse in Greek is an uncovering, an exposure. It's unveiling the glory and the majesty of our Lord. And I got to thinking about this as all the subjects that we've been talking about and uh, how to live in the last days and what the last days are all about. It seemed to me that we needed to take kind of an overview look at this. And I hope this will be a blessing to you. Uh, whether it is or not, it was a blessing to me. So I thank God, I've already studied this, so I've already been blessed. But I hope that you will uh, be able to get into it with me and understand what my point is. And it follows up so beautifully with what Jacob said. Other foundation can no man lay, but that which is laid in Jesus Christ. Now in Revelation 1.1, the title of the book is right in the first verse, The Revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Will you join me, please, in a moment of prayer? Our Father, how thankful we are for the privilege we've had these days to hear the Word of God, to hear about the issues of our time and our need of discernment. We are well aware that many people are attending churches today where it seems like we are so far away from the expository teaching of God's Word. And you told us to be diligent, to study, to show ourselves approved unto God, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. No cause for embarrassment, because this is the truth that will set us free. We need the Bible, the whole Bible, and nothing but the Bible. 
God, bring us back to a Bible-based ministry in this country. Father, we thank you for what you're doing around the world. We have many listeners right now in different countries, some who have freedom, some who do not. Thank you for the privilege through the internet of bringing your word to them. And may you be of great comfort by your Holy Spirit to their hearts as they hear the word of the living God. How we thank you and praise you. In the blessed name of our Lord Yeshua, we pray. Amen. I think the first and most important thing that we should say to all of you as you leave our conference is dealing with the final words of Jesus to the church. And uh, the entire book, of course, is to the church, but specifically chapter 2 and 3. But as I looked at this, it was the vision of the glorified Christ in chapter 1 that hit me so powerfully. I'm not going to do an exegesis of the whole thing. I'm simply going to tell you that one of the greatest needs we have, which has already been stated in the last hour, is to look to the glorified Lord. It reminds me of that little chorus. Maybe you'd like to join me. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Simple but profound. Look to the glorified Lord. The second thing I want you to see is learn how he sees the church. We've had a lot of messages this prophecy conference about what's wrong. And unfortunately, we have to talk about that because we're in a mess. And we need guidance from the Word of God that we get back to what churches should be. Well, when you have seven churches, and of course the significance of the number of seven has been substantiated already by our speakers out of the book of Revelation. But it obviously... Uh, is a powerful message to our hearts about our, our churches. Both what's wrong and what's right. And it's our Lord talking. He's telling us. And as has already been pointed out, everything said about him in this marvelous picture of him in chapter 1, all those ingredients are used in his messages to the churches to tell us something about what we need to know. Now, some people do see these seven churches as seven historical periods of time from the time of our Lord until today. And so they often speak about the fact that we're in the Laodicean period. I'm not sure that's a correct view. I think it's very interesting, but I don't have the Bible telling me that. What I do know is there are seven churches in John's day. Were those the only churches in Asia Minor? The answer is no, there were others. So the question would be in our mind, then why pick out the seven? Because the seven were all different from each other in terms of what the Lord wanted to communicate to all of us. Now we could ask the question, in these messages to the seven churches, is it really for all of us? Well, I guess we all believe the Bible's relevant to every generation, but specifically, is it for us? And the answer is absolutely, because every time in all seven church messages, he says, hear what the Spirit says to the? No, to the churches. He never says it's singular church. In other words, the messages of these seven letters are to all the churches. So whatever church you go to, this is what the Lord wants you to hear. And it comes from the Holy Spirit who inspired these men, so that what we have written is absolutely reliable and accurate and inerrant in every way. Now, in looking at that, I decided to just kind of break it down, giving an overview to help us understand as we leave this conference what we're really facing here. 
in the last days. Number one is Revelation chapter 2. Just look at it for a moment, verse 1. Under the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, they represent the angels, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, lampstands, or menorahs, that represent the church. The real punchline is in verse 4. Nevertheless, I have, my old King James says somewhat, that's not in the Greek text, I have against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. So if I was writing down what are the messages that God wants us to hear from these seven churches about the last days and what we will face. And I think the first thing is that the church has departed from its main priority. Interesting to me that seven times it emphasizes the absolute knowledge of our Lord as he said, I know thy works. Let's don't be confused, people. As we leave this conference and go back to the churches that we may be involved with, God knows everything about you, everything about your church, what you're doing or not doing. But his indictment is of an Orthodox church. The church at Ephesus was very strong and also quite large. Most of the churches were not that big. It was Orthodox. They were able to uh, discern false teaching and to deal with it. And so we'll give them credit. Amen? And we thank God for all churches that have that much discernment. But let's understand something. This is church number one. He could have started with Philadelphia or Sardis or any of them. He started with Ephesus, and I believe there's a reason. Because the steps down start when you leave your first love. When that lawyer came to Yeshua in Matthew 22 and said, what is the greatest commandment in the law, in the Torah? And Jesus answered him correctly, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. It's not just a doctrinal statement you put in your creed or constitution or bylaws. We're talking about an intensity here. Your whole life has one great passion, to love God with everything you are. Then he said, love your neighbor as yourself. And he said it was a second commandment that was like unto the first. Apparently, the lack of love in the body of Christ is rooted in our departing from the first priority, which is to love God with all of our hearts. That's where the decline starts. And the byproduct of that is, there will not be intense, fervent love for one another as a result. In our message earlier today, we dealt with how to live in the last days. And one of the first problems was as an obedient child, our lifestyle, but also our love for one another. He said, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. This isn't a passive, apathetic a statement to somebody that you know at church saying, yeah, I love you, man, amen. No, 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 this is a life that's dedicated to loving other people because the love of God is what is controlling you and constraining you. Second Corinthians 5.14 says, the love of Christ constraineth us. Now that can either be a subjective genitive in Greek or an objective genitive. It could mean Christ's love for us, that's probably the point. Or it could mean our love for Christ, which would be the point in Ephesians 2. The two go together, don't they? Because he loved us, we love. 1 John 4, 19. We love. Actually, Old King James says we love him. Him is not in the text. We love. We have the capacity to love the way God wanted us to. Why? Because he first loved us. 1 John 4, 9 and 10, and this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a propitiation for our sins. And in 1 John 2, 2, he said, not just for our sins, but the sins of the whole world. So let's understand something. What's really wrong with our church is we've left the first love for God himself. 
Number two, I think the one thing I learned about Smyrna, I was there not too long ago. It's a thriving city. Izmir is the third largest city in Turkey. And uh, it was originally Smyrna. There's a great story about Smyrna. And that is that a disciple of the Apostle John studied at his feet was named Polycarp. Polycarp was the pastor at Smyrna. Smyrna was also a seat of Caesar worship. They set up these altars where people had to burn incense and sacrifice an animal, declaring that Caesar is Lord. Sadly, many believers did it. All in the name of Scripture, saying we're supposed to obey the government. But Peter said in Acts 5, we ought to obey God rather than man. No, we have no desire to participate in the pagan practices of our political government. No, we are committed to a higher order and a higher authority, and that's God himself. So that'll cause some of us to get in trouble because we're not going to go along with it. Well, Polycarp didn't go along with it, and he was a great leader. Well, as you probably, if you've ever read the story, it's a true story. He was burned at the stake in front of the entire resident population of ancient Smyrna. He was an old man at the time. He came to know the Lord as a young child. And uh, in his recorded statement that they recorded that he said, and it became a very important testimony to the early church, he said, I've served the Lord for 86 years and he's never done me wrong. How in the world can I deny him in this moment of going to see him? Wow. Powerful testimony. By the way, his martyrdom is what stirred a great revival in Smyrna. Multitudes came to know the Lord. What did we learn? Because God said this church was going to suffer. We learn one thing, the church will face persecution. There's only one way of, uh, of avoiding persecution, as I see it, and that's to say nothing, do nothing, and be nothing. Does the Bible teach that all who will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution? It certainly does, 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. I'd like you to turn to Matthew chapter 5. We're trying to remember what the Lord said to us, and here are some wonderful, beautiful words we call the Beatitudes. Matthew chapter 5. What did our Lord say to us about persecution? In Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye, so now he's speaking directly to the disciples, when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. That's what my Lord said. Now turn over to John chapter 18. Interesting how often not only our Lord but the apostles spoke about persecution. In John chapter 15 and verse 18 we read this. If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Verse 20, middle of the verse. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will also keep you yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. Now, uh, when I grew up, I wondered whether, because of the freedom we enjoy uh, in our country, I wondered whether or not those words just meant them and not anybody in our time. 
Then as I got into college, I got involved uh, in a prayer group that prayed for the persecuted church. And I began to read about millions of Christians who have suffered for their faith. And I always wondered about it. When I got into pastoral ministry, I began to look at these things very seriously. In Matthew 5, he told me how it starts. They'll revile you. They'll say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Well, you're looking at somebody who after 53 years of preaching and teaching the Bible, I have experienced that verse and continue to do so. So much so that we've been threatened on several occasions. They know the names of my children and my grandchildren, and that can upset anybody and telling me what they're going to do to them if I don't shut up. Well, if I lose my teeth, I'm not stopping. I'm going to gum it to death. I'm going to keep going. I don't know about you, but I think that's why a lot of us are quiet. We've been intimidated. We are fearful. Yet our Lord said, don't fear what men can do to you. He said, don't fear him who can kill your body, but fear him who can cast both body and soul into hell. If there's a message we need in living here, leaving here, it's to speak up and be counted for the Lord and stop being intimidated. Stop falling into the ghetto of absolute silence. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. No matter what people say. Stand up and be counted and don't be afraid. The Lord has promised not only his protection, but his great reward to all of those who will stand for him in his glory and honor. Number three, when I came to the church at Pergamos, and having been to that historical site, boy, there's so much I could say. And we have messages on this, not only in uh, CD and MP3, uh, four, three, uh, MP3 format, but also a commentary on Revelation. Pergamus, wow. Listen, the Babylonian cult, that woman in Revelation 17 called Mystery, Babylon the Great, Mother of Harlots and Abominations, well, it's a mystery, evidently uh, not mysterious, but something that wasn't known in the past, it's known more and more as we move along. And it's a mother of harlots, so it's infected all nations of the world. And chapter 18 especially deals with that. This woman has seduced all the nations of the world. Babylon the Great, popularized by their high priestly caste of Ka Chaldeans. I got so fascinated by that in graduate school, I wrote a thesis on the subject of Babylon the Great. So right now you should pray that I don't feel obligated to tell you what I know about it. We'll be here all night. But it is rather interesting. The Chaldeans, this priestly caste of the Babylonian religion, did set up headquarters at Pergamos and were there at the time the book of Revelation was written. Eventually they moved to Haifa and had a monastery in Haifa, Israel. When political Rome fell in 476 A.D. by the Visigoth invasion, the bishop of Rome took on the title that the emperors had, Pontifex Maximus. Actually, they all got it from Octavian, the first to use it, who was Augustus Caesar. Octavian was a grandnephew of Julius Caesar, who was a high priest in the Babylonian religion. We know certain names, don't we? Either because of movies or books or whatever, but putting it together is another story. So guess what? The Bishop of Rome who took the title Supreme Pontiff, Pontifex Maximus, he came from the Babylonian religion, from the monastery in Haifa. His name was Damasist. You see, the facts in history are very, very important as you look at what the Bible actually says. The Bible's the most accurate account of ancient history. What happened at Pergamos? There was a complete compromise of the purity that God wanted. That means the doctrine of the second coming got weak because we read in 1 John 3, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, yet it doth not yet appear what we shall be, 
But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that has this hope in him, literally upon him, purifieth himself, even as he is pure. So the church definitely lost its purity. We can conclude very quickly that it stopped preaching the blessed hope. Paul wrote in Titus 2.13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's our hope. Our hope is beyond the grave, amen? And the older you get, the more this is precious to you. I look over the audience, and I see a lot of dudes and dudesses who, in fact, because of the way you look, you must be getting awful close. <laughs> close to what? Not to second coming death, amen? Oh, what a comfort that is to hear you. Oh. Listen, folks, it becomes pretty exciting when you know when you're absent from the body, you're present with the Lord. And every cup of cold water given his name will receive a reward. Eye has not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. Don't go out of here with depression. Go out of here with joy. But it's interesting, isn't it, that Theatira was filled with moral corruption. What's wrong with the church? It was tolerating moral pollution. We've had speakers deal with this subject. Pastor John Higgins dealt with 1 Corinthians 5, a classic example. We need to clean up our act. And you know and I know, I'm not insulting your intelligence, I'm simply warning us all. When we tolerate immorality, we're way down the line of what we should be. And it's going to be a struggle to get back on track. Ask yourself, what sort of sexual sins do you tolerate? Whether in mind and fantasy, we talked about that this week from Ecclesiastes 5. Or whether it is actually watching it, whether in the internet or some video you got from a video store. Or some television program that was parading it and you couldn't take your eyes off of it. Excuse me, I like to say revival begins at my doorstep. You know, we're all, each of us, responsible to get right with the Lord. Amen? We've got to be careful about what we're tolerating and allowing to exist in the church of Jesus Christ. If you want to know his power, if you want to see that church passionate for evangelism and winning folks to Christ and seeing people growing in the Lord, in the grace and knowledge of our Lord, then we have to deal with sin. We don't sweep it under the rug. We also don't expose it to everybody in the body of Christ either until a person remains in total rebellion to the church's stand, and then we got to tell it to the church. But before that, we should go with two or three, because in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word is established. That's a principle in God's law. Don't just go as one person, two or more, to the sinning brother. And the goal is to see that the person get right with the Lord. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye who are spiritual, Restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Boy, that's powerful stuff. The church that tolerates moral pollution is already finished. Unless they get right with the Lord. Now we have emphasized in this conference, some of you have brought it up to me so many times I know that it got across. We've been bringing up the issue of repentance. Amen? The first word of the gospel. We are told to turn unto the Lord, and he will turn unto us. And to turn from our wicked ways. Solomon had a wonderful day dedicating the temple. My, they were rejoicing. Great food. Singing the praises of the Lord. That night he retired in his bedchamber and feeling really great over the day. And the Lord chose that first night 
to talk to him out loud. Here's what he said. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Do not think, Solomon, because of this beautiful building that you have dedicated to me, that that's all that's necessary. And I would say to all of you, no matter how wonderful your church building and property looks, no matter how beautiful the people might look, we need to understand what God expects. Repentance must begin at the house of God. For the Bible says that judgment will begin at the house of God. Quit blaming the world. They're only doing what comes naturally. We need to blame ourselves for our compromise and toleration of evil. Amen? I don't know, you're either sleepy, tired, or don't know that the Lord is listening. Amen? Amen. Yeah, right. Number five, if there's one thing we can say about Sardis, boy, they've lost their power. You have a name, but you're dead in a doornail. Wonder how many churches in this town have a name, but the power is gone. Paul wrote in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Messiah, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Jesus said, when the Holy Ghost will come upon you, you will receive power to be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and all Judea, in Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. Luke tells us they stayed in Jerusalem until they were endued, clothed with power from on high. And churches all over this land are acting like we could somehow do our ministry without the power of the Holy Spirit. Something is really wrong. What we need is not a church building. We think we do. What we need is the Bible and the power of the Holy Spirit. We can meet in the worst hut in the world if we want. We can meet anywhere. We can meet in homes like they did a long time ago and like many people are doing once again. But what we do need is the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says when they were filled with the Spirit, they spake the Word of God with boldness. That's what it says. And with great power, they gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. My friends, don't try to live your Christian life without the power of the Holy Spirit. Every believer has the Holy Spirit. If you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, you're not a believer. Romans 8 9 is clear. But because you have the Holy Spirit doesn't mean the Holy Spirit has you. He's a gentleman. He's not going to force his way in your life. To be filled with the Spirit means that you are controlled by Him. If you're controlled by Him, then what He wrote, for He is the true author of the Bible, is important to you, no matter where it's found in the Bible. And the Bible, therefore, becomes a lamp under your feet and a light under your path. You are dominated by biblical truth, and you can't get away from it. And the Holy Spirit of God takes that wonderful, inerrant, inspired word and comes through your life and makes all the difference to where you work and where you live and to the people that you know. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit's power. Amen? Long ago when they built that miserable looking place they called a temple after the destruction of Jerusalem by Babylon, Many years later, you'll remember, it wasn't much. Haggai and Zechariah came along to promote the people to build the temple instead of building their own places. Haggai, I say, is it time for you to dwell in your sealed houses while this house of the Lord lies waste? Consider your ways. You've sown much and you bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. 
And, and when you earn money, you put it into a bag with holes. He was a contemporary for at least one month, if not more, with Zechariah. And in Zechariah chapter 4, he gives us an insight about ministry and the work of the church, even though it was referring to that little rebuild place. He said it's not by might or power, speaking of human ability, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. When you put the top stone on this thing, when you finish the project, we'll all shout grace, grace to it. For God's grace made it all possible. And it happened because of the power of the Holy Spirit working in the lives of his people. May God help us. Number six. It's hard to know what God meant in Philadelphia. Most uh, writers speak about commending it. And yet there's a sense in which I believe God is confronting the church in all seven cases. I did a little study on the history of Philadelphia. Uh, the Appian Way and all Roman roads actually went straight through this place. They had access to the then known world if they wanted it. Easy access in contrast to most people who didn't have that. And God even said, I've set before you an open door and no man can shut it except me. It seems to me that what we're learning here is the church does not see its potential for evangelism in its local place as well as around the world. Whatever happened to missions? Recent studies show that less than 10% of what churches gave in 1950 are given now to worldwide missions. What happened to us? Well, other things became more important than taking a gospel to the world that desperately needs to hear him. We still have thousands of dialects that have yet to receive one verse of scripture in their own language. We have 16,000 people groups that have never heard the gospel. Missiologists tell us that the percentage of those of us who have heard the gospel versus those who haven't has really changed in the last 30 years. Surprisingly, it's getting worse if you're looking at it that way. There are fewer people on planet Earth who've been exposed to the gospel than those who haven't. The percentage was better 30 years ago. What's happening? Our world is becoming secular? Yes. And we are facing a changing world with its changing moral values, the growth of Islam. They give you all kinds of reasons. But wait a minute, what about your church and mine? I remember well the day I announced to our church that I'm praying that one day, for every dollar we spend here at home, we will have a dollar going to foreign missions. People thought I was crazy. But in a little over seven years, that's what we were doing. And what a blessing it is. And I found that uh, in our home when we were praying around the table with our kids when they were little. We would take pictures of missionaries who came home and we put them on giant prayer cards and write the names of the parents and the children and a few little prayer requests for them. We had a stack of that. Every morning we'd pass them around as all the family would pray for those who are taking the gospel around the world. I hope that just these simple illustrations will encourage some of you to start caring about a world that desperately needs the Lord. The church didn't see its potential. How about you? And number seven, all of us have been challenged by Laodicea. It's a church obsessed with material possessions. They are rich and have need of nothing. And God says, I just prefer to spew you out of my mouth. You make me want to throw up. It really hit me reading Revelation 3.20. All of you sweet folks here who've taught little children's classes know Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man, anyone, hear my voice and will open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. 
I've heard all the arguments on it. In fact, in my book on Revelation, you can read them all, what people say. You know, I believe the thing that all the kids in Sunday school thought it meant is probably correct. First of all, Jesus is outside the door. And little kids notice that right off the bat. He's outside the door of the church. How come he's outside? And then they notice that he didn't address all the people in the church, but only those who would open the door. I remember my wife telling me a little kid in her Sunday school class said, well, the doorknob must be on the inside. Wasn't that cute? That's really what's there. Yeshua says, I'm standing at the door knocking, and if anyone will open it, so the doorknob must be on the inside. He's not going to force his way in and knock the door down. And he promises to fellowship with us and have a meal with us. That we'll be his and he'll be ours. And how many of us have used that to tell little children the gospel? One Sunday between the third and fourth morning services, we also had two evening services. I was usually a basket case after that day, sort of like the prophecy conference we have. But anyway, uh, very tired, worn out, all of that. And a lady came running up from a Sunday school class and she said, oh, I'm so thrilled. I said, why? She says, your youngest son just asked Jesus in his heart in my Sunday school class. I said, oh, that is really wonderful. I gave him Revelation 3.20 and he saw it and he opened the door of his heart to Jesus. I said, that's really wonderful. You know, I didn't have the heart to tell her that he had done that 12 times that year alone. <laughs> you parents could appreciate that, but I want you to know, don't ever stop him. I don't care which one it was that he got it. I just know he got it. And he sits right outside my office today. And God has blessed him with a heart for evangelism. Listen, Jesus is standing at the door, but he's outside. Why don't you let him in? But there's a third thing I want to say to you. Look to the glorified Lord. Amen. Learn how he sees the church right on. But also listen to the Holy Spirit. Seven times he told us to do that. Seven times. Listen. Hear what the Spirit says. Let me just summarize it. What the Spirit said is there's a need of repentance. If we walk away with anything, let's walk away with the need of repentance. Repentance is not just feeling sorry for what you have done or that you got caught. It is a change of mind about what you've done. You start thinking the way God does instead of the way you've been acting. And then you're willing to change your conduct as well. That's godly repentance. If you want a detailed description, it's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And verse 11. And there are seven traits of true godly repentance. We have this on a tape if you'd like to hear it. But let me tell you, it is one of the most eye-opening things you could ever study on what true godly repentance is like. He even contrasts it with the sorrow of the world. It's like Esau. Oh, he shed tears but Hebrews 12 says it was without repentance. Or like Judas, yes, he cried too, but he went out and hung himself. We need to understand what true godly repentance is. And then we notice there's a need of remembering. How interesting that the Lord would tell us, remember what it was like. Remember from where you have fallen. Uh, not always. Is that true of every new believer? I know that. In chapter 3, verse 3, to the dead church in Sardis, he said, Remember how thou hast received and heard. You know, the longer you're in the Lord, if you're not careful, if there's no real heart for God here, you can easily ignore what you first heard about. You can assume, oh, I know about that. But we need to renew our minds constantly. But third, there's a need of resolve. 
It's an old hymn that says, I'm resolved no longer to linger. Listen to this, Revelation 2, verse 10. Be thou faithful unto death. Revelation 2, 25. Hold fast till I come. Revelation 3, 10. Strengthen the things which remain. Revelation 3, 11. Hold that fast which thou hast. There's a need of resolve of doing something about what our Lord said. Seven churches, seven descriptions of our Lord, holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks in the midst of the churches. He's the first and the last which was dead and is alive. He has a sharp sword with two edges, representing his powerful word out of his mouth. He's the Son of God, whose eyes are like a flame of fire and his feet are like fine brass. He is holy. He is true. He has the key of David. He opens and no man shuts and shuts and no man's open. He's the amen, the faithful and true witness. He's the beginning of the creation of God. He is Alpha and Omega. He is the Almighty. He is the first and the last. How much do we need? Revelation says more about his true identity and his attributes in the entire New Testament. It's a revelation, an unveiling of Jesus Christ. And no other foundation can any man lay but that which was laid in Jesus Christ. 